and welcome to Rock Your Block, where we're highlighting individuals who are making an impact in the community. I'm your host, Larry Laws. On today's segment of First Home Alliance, we have with us a very special guest. He is a public servant, activist, and voice for the voice. He is a 13-year-old eighth grader who attends the School Without Walls in Washington, D.C. He serves as an intern for one of the district's assembly members. He is also president of the National Junior Honor Society at his school. Most recently, he was honored to become the Northeast Region Representative for National Action Network, Youth Huddle. Please welcome to our show, Ryan Battle. Ryan, welcome to our show. How are you doing today? Well, how are you? I'm doing fine. Yes, um, we're going to get started here. Um, why don't you just share a little bit of uh, highlights about what you're doing? Um, so like you said, I'm 13 and um, my goal in life is to be the president in a voice for the voiceless and being the president will just basically have what I feel like the world should be better in or what I feel like my true desires to change in the world would be and then being a world leader is when I find when I make that big jump to using solutions from other countries to help maybe change or make the situation better in other countries because just because our solutions don't might not work for us that doesn't mean someone else's solutions might not work. Yeah. Ryan, you, you're ambitious and I, I really uh, um, I'm impressed with that. Uh, what motivates you to uh, strive for those things? Um, so I'm, what motivates me is because when I was younger, about like four years old, um, my birth mom was 13 when she was pregnant with me and then she was 14 when she actually had me. So um, at four years old, I was homeless and I had to eat out of like trash cans, drink dirty water and find places to sleep and stuff like that. And I'm motivated by that because, well, what I want is for people that come after me not to have to go through that same thing because I feel like no one should have to struggle or go through hardships to get to their true goals and their dreams. Well, that, that is amazing. I'm quite sure that you're going to impact a lot of people. Uh, where are you now uh, in reference to this school, uh, School Without Walls? Have you always attended that school? Um, no, for sixth and seventh grade, I went to Howard University Middle School, which is actually on the Howard University campus. And at that camp, when I was in sixth and seventh grade, seeing other people that looked like me, it let me know that going to college was really a thing and that a bunch of people that look like me do it too. So it's like, I don't know if you could call it the cool thing, but it's certainly something that I know that I could do in future terms. But um, now in eighth grade, I attend school at that walls at school at that walls in D.C. the uh, middle school because um, they offered me to take geometry class, and since I'm doing high school math, mm -hmm. um, my other school didn't have that opportunity for me, so I went to that school to take high school math at school at that walls high school that's on G.W. campus. So you got it all there. You got junior high, high school, and you're also on a university campus. Do you already have plans to attend college? Um, yes. For college, I think I either want to go to Harvard or Howard. In Harvard, because it's one of the best schools in the United States. In Howard, because um, it's the mecca for HBCU. So that's like, that would be a great honor to be able to go to that school when I get older. Yes, and so how was your experience there on campus when you had the opportunity for Howard University? Um, I just think that the like setting was really nice because it's like right off the water, so it's like cool. Cause from my school building, you could like literally look to the the back, and then you see water, and then the trees, how the, it like turned brown and gold and stuff in the fall, and um, just seeing other people that look like me again influenced me to let me know that college is actually a thing that I can do whether or not um, like whether or not I am mm -hmm. like not saying that I don't think I can do it but it just made me it just basically confirmed that it's possible. Oh that's great yes and um, there at Howard University um, um, how was the culture there? Um, I think 
the way that people treated each other and and generally because like some people at my school particularly they weren't all not all of them were interested in that stuff because we're in their communities that's not like um so it was a yes. majority like people of color so mm -hmm. not necessarily everybody in the school came from uh opportunities that I'm like thankful to have because just I don't know why but just because of their family and the way that they function so their likes and dislikes were different from mine but we basically use that to learn from each other. Super and uh, you also work as an intern uh, and so you're a uh, I understand a public servant but you are also servant as an intern tell me a little bit about the uh, what you do. Um, so when I was interning it started in the summer of 2016 yes the mm -hmm. summer of 2016 okay. and um basically how that started was the assembly member he was preaching at church one day and while he was preaching I was just thinking maybe I can get an internship so then I asked my mom what an internship was and she then she told me and then when he's finished preaching, all all the time the preachers have to go back to the back of the church and like shake hands with everybody when they walk out. So while she was getting our stuff together, I ran over to ask him if I could intern for him. And he was like, if your mom says you can. So then I come back and I'm like, he says I can intern. And then she's like, what? And then we all both go over there and then he's like, I said, it. and he's like, if it's okay with you. And then she said it is. So then that summer, I, that's when my internship started. And I did a bunch of stuff from like taking notes, uh, doing phone calls, um, petitioning, mm -hmm. uh, staffing at events, and yes. a whole range of stuff. Yes. Well, you know, working in a position like that, you know, that that's an elected official. And so, uh, could you share with me, what do you think the importance of voting? Um, I think that your vote is your voice because without voting you don't necessarily get what you need and if you don't vote and what you want doesn't happen you can't like complain because you're not the one because you didn't step up to the plate because voting is something everybody can do mm -hmm. you just have to want to do it so it can happen yes and with that uh, you said that uh, also I've seen a passage where you wrote that uh, you have the power to give life or destroy that can you explain it to me um, so what MLK once said that your voice has the, no, MLK once said that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So what that basically means is, well, I'm going to relate it to now, like with your vote right now, that is your voice. And if you don't vote, that could be the difference between getting what you need or just I don't know, like everything is like going downhill. So, um, and if everybody votes, then what you need will happen or mm -hmm. most likely happen. And then everyone in your community, like the future generations, because most of the time when you vote for people or elected officials, they stay for a couple of years. So then your situation will get end up getting better, but just not voting will just like basically lead everything downhill. Yes, you just have to be subtle. Uh, you have to settle for what someone else's chose, <laughs> someone else's choices. Yeah, now you was talking about voting and I understand that the position you're working in. Um, uh, civil rights seem to be um, uh, something that you're very interested in. Um, do you, are you familiar with the Civil Rights Act? Um. Yes, I did some research on the same. You did? <laughs> okay. Uh, and so tell me a little bit about what you uh, know about civil rights. Um, what I think, so the civil rights to me is basically human rights or all rights in general because mm -hmm. the civil rights cover education, um, human rights which is the same thing as women's rights. Uh, I guess you could say religionist rights too, it doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. um, it covers all rights, basically. 
and back like back in the day mm -hmm. when the first civil rights act was passed they were just saying everyone's equal but then equal just means having the same thing so like you so like um certain people will have like better housing than you because i know that's something that you uh like to um that you find like that you're very fond of yes um so like certain people have better housing mm -hmm. but equal is just having housing too so people can have worse housing and better housing but it has to be equity which means having the same thing at the same time at the same place so if someone else is going to have good housing then you need to have good housing too or if education needs to be the same because um for example, in Texas, kids don't necessarily have Wi-Fi and stuff at home, so they have to put Wi-Fi on the buses so that they can do their homework. Really? And um, in D.C., for example, at my old school, it was a two-to-one, so each student had two computers, one to take home and one in school. But there's a school like that's like 20 blocks down the street, and they have 30 students per classroom and only eight computers. Yes, yes, and so it is uh, not necessarily equal. But, uh, and so civil rights, we talked about the religion, we talked about the housing, and so those are protections. And so, uh, again, uh, and so after the break, uh, we're going to talk about how that's going to relate more to housing. Okay, but uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, hold one second, we're about to take a break. Um, but before we go, I would like to remind you that First Home Alliance is a HUD-approved housing and counseling agency serving the national capital area. If you're, the first, if you're a first-time home buyer or a homeowner in need of mortgage assistance, please visit the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development website to find a HUD-approved housing counseling agency in your area. When we return after the break, Ryan will be talking about his plans for the future. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. The combined federal campaign and United Way Federation impacts quality of life nationally and across the globe. First Home Alliance, a community-based nonprofit housing counseling agency approved by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to provide, to provide comprehensive housing assistance programs to help low to moderate income and veteran families. First Home Alliance is a CFC approved charity and proud member of the United Way of the National Capital Area. Welcome back. You're watching Rock Your Block. This is First Home Alliance segment, and I'm your host, Larry Laws, here with you today, our special guest, Ryan Battle. Ryan, before the, uh, the break, we was talking about civil rights, and I want to know, do you consider yourself an advocate for civil rights? Um, yes, I do, because I think civil rights isn't just having equality, it's having equity. And like I said earlier, that means having the same thing at the same time, at the same place, not just having the same thing. Okay. And um, why, uh, you know, when you're dealing with civil rights, why is it uh, important that uh, it protects from discrimination? Um, I think it's important that it protects you from discrimination because... Hmm. Okay. And you know, some of those uh, uh, protections, some of those classes, you know, in reference to age, color, uh, why should they be protected from that uh, by this right? Why should it protect that? Um, it should protect who you are as a person because your background doesn't necessarily determine who you are because just because I'm a, okay, so we'll use like what's been happening like with police brutality, like just because I'm a person of color and let's say a cop pulls me over or something, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna do something wrong just because of what I look like. Because there's, with the police brutality going on like this last summer, each, every single day I woke up, there was another person of color that was killed. So what you look like doesn't necessarily determine how you act in a situation. But if people were, um, like rights were protected, like all those lives could have been um, spared because they wouldn't have been judged based on how they look for the actions that 
for the actions that follow. Yes, and so uh, without this protection, do you think that people would just do the right thing? Um. Mm, well, <laughs> <laughs> me personally, I would do the right thing, but um, not everybody's going to necessarily say, "Okay, here's a." person that doesn't look like me so and I act this way they're not going to necessarily think you're going to act the same way so really no I don't think you don't think they'll do the right no. thing okay there was a um, uh, there's been different amendments for the Civil Rights Act and in, uh, in 1964 there was an uh, amendment that dealt with uh, equal employment opportunity and so uh, how do you think that affected uh, uh, people with that uh, pr that protection on employment. Um. So when I was doing research about that, so like we know that would be farther back. Um, but um, equal employment opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what I think that means is, or how that could apply now would be. Back in the day, your job mainly depended on your skin color, so like the amount you get paid mm -hmm. and being a woman or not affected your pay. Like, I don't know if it's like, because like what me and my mom were talking about, it's like for every dollar a man gets a lady, a woman might get 70 cents. So I don't know exactly how much it is now. It probably got better. But um, just the way you look, can affect your pay and like with my mom um, when she worked for one of her businesses she um, had the like background for like to have a, a, to be a senior like be a top ahead of everybody but just because she was the only person of color and the only woman at that job they kept her at the uh, middle person but she still got paid the amount but they just wouldn't give her the title yes Yes, and that uh, so I think that uh, uh, act uh, in that sense was um, definitely beneficial for equal employment. Now, closer to what um, you know, I'm so uh, interested in, and uh, what motivates me is in reference to housing. And so uh, there was an amendment in um, 1968, the Fair Housing Act, uh, which was a landmark um, uh, uh, amendment to the act. What do you know about fair housing? Um. So when I researched this, I found out that around, like it said from 1960s to the 1980s, people of color, the people of color population jumped from 6.1 million to 15.3. And then that's like a, that's like doubled or yes, yeah, doubled the mm -hmm. amount. Um, but when that happened, uh, the housing like people of color were centered in one area and were in you couldn't buy houses in this area just because of how you looked and what happened was people of color were starting to move into the cities and then the people that lived there before them they were like hold on I'm not going to associate with them let me move to the suburbs mm -hmm. and so you end up having people of color in this one area without like a Walmart or a food line or something and the people that moved out of there they'd come back and like have a corner store where they'd sell you everything that you need for double the price and um, Mm -hmm. yeah. That leads me also in uh, a sense that I heard you uh, speak about about uh, gentrification and so uh, uh, share that with us um, so basically what gentrification is, is basically when, um, like companies that like make houses and stuff mm -hmm. or the government, like they'll buy a house from you for a certain amount of money. And then when you leave, they'll knock the house down and then make a better house so that m new people can move into the areas and, um, Basically, I'm not sure if it necessarily makes it better, but they'll try to move you out from where you are and buy your house away because 
um, let's say you're gonna like rent your house out, right? Mm -hmm. Your dollar, like the value of your dollar might be less in other countries, so like when you try to trade a dollar, you might not get necessarily what it was worth. But if you have housing, you can charge whatever you want for your house. Like you could charge like 20 Twizzlers for a room or Starburst for a room or something. And just, you can literally charge whatever you want just for people to be able to live in your house with you. Yes, and how, how important do you think uh, decent, affordable shelter, how is important is that? Um, I think that's really important because like after you come home from like a hard day work, you don't want to have to worry if you could like take a hot shower mm -hmm. or if the air condition is gonna work if it's too hot or even like the kids in Texas, they have to worry about whether or not they can do their homework when they get home. So I think it's really necessary to have a good housing, not just affordable housing, but good housing. Good, decent, okay. Yes, and uh, what about, you ever um, thought about home ownership? Um, what does home ownership mean to you? What did it mean? I just think, I think home ownership, it, what it means to me is that well, obviously you own your home, but mm -hmm. you get to do whatever you want with your home. Like, you could like rent it out for other people to come in and like, um, like pay for the rent, like charge them for everything that they use so that you could pay it off. And basically be able to have like the free will to do whatever you want with your house. Okay. Now I know you took you was on campus for a while, so I'm going to ask you something that I ask uh, adults. Do you know what an interest rate is? Um. Yes. That yes. is basically when you put money into the bank, and depending on how much interest the bank says that you get for what you put in, like an annual interest rate, like if they say it's like zero point five. Um, let's say it's like 10% mm -hmm. and you put in $100, each year you get 10 more dollars if that's the case. Okay, what about interest when it comes to borrowing money? Um, like debt, kind of? Yes, if you have debt because you have a principal amount, but you, when you pay it back, you have to pay a little extra. That extra that you pay back, that is the interest. Now, do you know what impacts the interest rate that you get? Um, so that wasn't on the test, was it? No. So, of course, <laughs> okay. But what, what was on the uh, test was financial education, a financial literacy education. Yeah. And so financial literacy education, tell me what you know about financial literacy education. Um, financial literacy education just basically helps you um, know what to do with your money. So like you don't have to end up being in debt for like college and things like that because you're spending your money wisely because mm -hmm. you know what you need and what you don't need. Yes, so with that financial literacy education, you understand how to manage your money and pay your debt when those things are uh, due. Uh, actually, all those things are recorded on what you call a credit report file. And so given your credit report file, they give you a, a score, and then when you go out and borrow money, then they'll decide what interest rate that you get. And so would you think that that would, that would, that would be important? Um, yes, I think that'd be important because if it determines like how much money you get to borrow or how much interest you get for putting it in money, mm -hmm. I think that it could like really affect some people's lives and like change a bunch of situations. Yes. And how, how young should a person, or how old should a person be when they start learning about financial education? Um, I think the youngest should be like six, but not like a class like your parents just teaching you what financial literacy is but like having actual classes for I think maybe eighth grade mm -hmm. because at that age you're like 13 going on 14 then when you get in ninth grade that's when you're gonna get your job and that's when you're gonna want to start spending money and if you spend all your money when you're in ninth grade then you're not gonna have any for later to actually do get stuff that you need so I think around that range. Okay. Hey Ryan, I really have enjoyed this uh, interview with you and uh, I'm uh, again I uh, applaud you for the things that you're doing. I want you to continue to, to uh, uh, strive for, to reach those high goals. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Ryan and found his story 
to be amazing? If you would like to make contact, his information is on your screen. You can also view the speeches and great work on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Now it's time to check our inbox to see how we can help rock your block. This is where we share a recent question sent to us from you, our, our viewing audience, about financial stability and housing. Today's question comes from Woodbridge, Virginia. Should I pay off an account that is in collections? Well, the answer really depends. If it's an old account, it's aged, it's going to fall off your credit report in seven years. If it's a young collection account, what I would recommend that you negotiate with the creditor and see if you can come up with some type of payment plan. It is your debt and it's your responsibility to pay. Again, I am Larry Laws of First Home Alliance and it has been a pleasure sharing with you our mission and highlighting individuals that impact our community. If you have questions about financial literacy or how to make your dream of homeownership tangible, send your questions to my inbox at help at firsthomealliance.org. Be sure to tune in to our show next time to see if your question was selected to be shared. You can easily get more information about our services by visiting our website at firsthomealliance.org. Thank you for watching today's segment of First Home Alliance, and we look forward to seeing how you rock your block. Flex Bootcamp is a pilot program. We are seeking applicants that are serious about getting into financial shape and willing to take on the Financial Literacy Education Experience Challenge. We ask candidates for a 12-month commitment of financial management conditioning. We offer 10 financial education modules augmented by monthly confidential one-on-one -on -one financial coaching sessions. We are committed to help you reach your financial goal. Your success is our success. If you are interested, please visit our website for more information.